reminds me of uh, that time when I went with you to the Parrot in Middletown, remember? Um, David was asked to go speak to this darling group of old men that met for breakfast here. And I went with David, and I remember them asking you, so where are you from? And David said, heaven. And I was kind of uncomfortable. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they laughed. Ah. And then they said, no, really, where are you from? And David said, heaven. And I was very uncomfortable at the time. I'm like, oh, can you just say, you know, heaven and truth, but Cincinnati, you know. And, <laughs> and I, I was just very nervous. But now, now I get it. Because that's the only real answer, right? Yeah, that was. I still remember that very vividly because it was. What was it? we had a retired minister, a retired <laughs> philosopher, and a retired s s scientist or psychologist or whatever, all with white hair. And I just, I remember going in there and I felt this spirit just soaring through me, and and they took me back to the back of the diner in this little town, and they all they all gathered around, and then they just they were very curious and very authentic. They're all retired, you know, and they they sit and they would meet every day like my grandfather used to do to discuss the world and ponder what's happening and this and that. So the spirit was just ripping through me that day with such clarity and joy and happiness. And I do remember we got into the topic of non-duality and, and transcending duality very quickly. And and then I they were asking me all these questions and the spirit was just ripping through and then I remember at one point um, you were at the table and there were there was a group of them sitting there. One of them asked. They said, um, "When we leave the human experience and we go back into perfect love and perfect oneness, is there any trace of individuality that comes with us into the oneness?" And I said, "No." And all these old bodies, these men, they just they all shook simultaneously. I kind of looked down the table. And it was so cool. They were so sincere and genuine. Take going right to the top with everything, you know, really going for it. And they just shook that there was no sense of individuality. I said, but there is indivisibility. You're un undividable. You're indivisible. All you have to do is take that word individual still got the divide in it, and turn it to indivisible. Indiv it's indivisible. You cannot divide oneness. It's just what it is. There's nothing in this world that relates to the oneness. And when you leave your memory of this, there's no trace of individuality that, that remains, that lingers. Individuality. You've got the duality and, and the divide still in the individual, and it's not going it, it can't come back to heaven because it doesn't exist. But I thought it was so cute, the little quiver. And then we just went right on with the next questions because they were very, very, very sincere. And actually, um, one of the, the elderly men was the biological father of, of Pam. And he lit up, he got into the course. Pam would call me sometimes and going, my God. God, he's gone off the deep end with the course. He's just completely... <laughs> hey, you're retired. you got nothing better to do than undo time and space now. He's like, he's on to it. He's working at undoing the wife concept, undoing the family concept, undoing the daughter concept. He's just... He took... He went off the deep end with it. And I've had been back there since and had some wonderful encounters with him and everything. But one time when we were at the lighthouse where uh, um, Lila used to live... Um, Jason had just made one of his latest movies, his many movies, and he took, do you remember the Nicolas Cage movie, Knowing? Has anybody ever seen Knowing? It's about the end of the world. Well, Jason had made a mini movie about the end of the world. I mean, it goes, the end of the world is very quick in that movie. It goes into a blaze of light. It gets hit by the solar flare. <laughs> trying to run and everyone's trying to protect themselves and everything, and boom, this big solar flare is wiping out the earth. And I remember showing your dad that mini-movie, and he was like, all happy, <laughs> as I was giving him a retranslation of the total of the end of the world. He was just like so 
happy. It was just a little mini movie that we all watched together there at the lighthouse. And to me, that's, that's a good example of it. Like, you know, Frances has told the story a number of times about her mother and being from China, and her mother was into, you know, upward mobility and advancement and all those things. Wanted the best education and the best life for her daughter and everything. But as soon as Frances really got into the spirit and realized that she had to let go of everything, all the concepts, there was a little time when when the mother concepts started to show up kind of in a kind of a, a reactive, uh, questioning, doubting, kind of a sharp way. But then when Frances persisted in just staying and aligning with love and truth and the light, um, she went back and had this conversation with her mom over in Beijing. And her mother was basically saying, if I'm not the mother and you're not the daughter, then who are we? Who are we? And what is our relationship? And Frances just was there and she said, well, it's a dream. You know, just like at nighttime, it's a dream. It's, it's just a dream. It's a dream of those roles. It's just, it's not a reality, it's just a dream. And her mother went, oh, I get it. I get it. I totally get it. Oh. You, you and David are deep. That's deep. So she's like delivering the ultimate, that there is no mother-daughter relationship, that it's all just a dream. And her mother is totally reflecting back like, yeah, 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 I get it. And then from that point on, it's like she then hears her mother's having mystical experiences. She's like going from the mom concepts and she's like rocketing up into <laughs> mystical experiences from that being real and true and not trying to compromise the teachings. And her mom's like, yeah, yeah. Now, when her mom's friends say, where, where is Frances? What has she become? Uh, what is her life now? And this and this and this. Her mother said, I can't hardly relate to him anymore. She's undoing the people game so fast that she's starting to realize that even her friends that are still talking about the linear ways, they aren't real either. They're just part of that dream, a fading dream. And, and just the witness of the mystical experiences coming back, you know, wouldn't you wish that for your children? Wouldn't you wish that for your mother and your father? Wouldn't you wish mystical experiences of union on everyone? If you could have pixie dust and just sprinkle your neighbors with pixie dust. If you had your mystical union dust, you put it on your dog and your cat, and your cat's like, you know, you just, if you just start sprinkling this dust, you had lots of it, pockets full of it, bags full, a whole backpack full of it, boom, just dumping it everywhere, on the lawyers, the doctors, on, just spewing it out everywhere. Your neighbor screaming at you, poof, in the face, with lots of it. You know, it's like, if, if you have the power, if you have the power in your mind to really be truthful and honest, then the only thing that would stop you would be compromise. If you really let your light shine, of course it's going to shine back on you. Of course it's going to reflect back on you. I just had my, my biological, the mother and, and sister of David in the parable come out here and... They came out to Camus and they came right out to the monastery. It was so cool. I've invited them for years and they came out here and their eyes were so big. And they were in such a state of wonder. Like, wow, wow, what a life. What has become of you? Wow, we never knew. We never had a clue. We never had an inkling. And then they went back to Denver and then they flew back to Cincinnati. And then I got a voicemail on my, my cell phone, my iPod, my iPhone from my biological mother, and she was like saying, it was such an honor to meet all those people. You truly have surrounded yourself with, with the most open and loving people. Uh, and, and it's so beautiful to see that that's what's become of your life. She, that's the message that she left. Maybe 45 second message was, look what you've surrounded yourself with. 
and she's just, she's probably 80, 81 years old, it was a message of gratitude, you know, and that's what you would want for all of your family members, that's what you would want for everyone in your life, to be reflections of that divinity. And the only way that it will happen is for you to accept your own divinity, because your mind is that powerful. If you're divine, so are they. If you're limited, so are they. If you believe in limitations, you're going to see a limited world. And if you truly experience the unlimited awesomeness and power of love, you will just call forth and attract witnesses of that love. And I can happily say that, you know, it doesn't matter which country I go to now, it's like, we, it is a fiesta, it is a party, it is a sense of happiness. We, we do dance, and we sing, and we play music, and we hug, and we go for ice cream parties, and we have pizza parties, and, you know, hey, occasionally we get together and talk about metaphysics, but people are kind of like, even with the metaphysics, it's like yada, 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 you know, everybody wants the joy. They want that experience of the joy. They don't want to just even play around with the concepts of the metaphysics anymore. People are tired of that. It's, it's, it's old news. I mean, the, the, the introduction to A Course in Miracles says, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, herein lies the peace of God. Isn't that straight enough? Isn't that simple enough? The 1,200 pages was just for intellectuals. Even Helen Shuckman, the scribe, said, at last a pathway to God for the intellectuals. But it's not saying you have to be an intellectual. You know, you can be simple. People sometimes say, I'm simple-minded. I say, thank you for the compliment. They say, David doesn't have all of his marbles anymore. That's true, I don't have any of them. <laughs> they say, sometimes, loco, loco. Yeah, I... I it maybe looks like that to the world, but I don't feel loco. I don't feel insane anymore. I feel happy. Happy is sanity. Unhappiness is insanity. And when you're happy, it doesn't really matter what the world may say or do. You know, you, you are a blessing. You radiate a blessing to everything and everyone, without exception. I just talked to a realtor today about this little peace house in Cincinnati, and and at the very end of it, her name was Levita. I never had talked to her, but I just talked to her for the first time today. And at the very end of the conversation, she said, at the first time I'd ever talked to her, she said, be blessed. <laughs> ah, that's my realtor. Okay. <laughs> it just, that's what you want the realtor to end the conversation with. Be blessed. Be blessed. And that's, that's the reflections that you are entitled to. You're entitled to miracles. You're entitled to happiness and joy. You're entitled to fun. Have fun. But let the Spirit guide you into that fun. Don't try to use egoic ways to have fun because, you know, sadness will seem to enter in. Cracks will be in your fun. But if you let the Spirit guide you in your fun, then you can, you know, they always say, let's have some good old wholesome fun. Well, yeah, wholesome, I like wholesome. You know? Sounds good to me. Whole. Oh.